in and uh, happy to answer any questions. So, do you want to fire up the slides or you want me oh, to? Oh, sure. Whatever. It's bring it up so we can see. Outstanding. Okay. So, uh, by way of background, like Melly said, my name's Scott. Uh, my company is Rose City Label. Um, we're a Portland based family business. My sister and I own the company. And we're, uh, we're in our 86th year of business. About half of that has been my family. And we're really, really fortunate. We, uh, we, we took a little nosedive in it like everybody. But since then, we've been growing and buying more equipment and adding more breweries. And it's just been an awesome ride, uh, especially the beer business the last five to seven years. It's just we print for 50 breweries now. And most of those weren't, they maybe they existed, but they certainly weren't bottling uh, three years from ago. So it's been a nice growth area for us. As you see on the slide, 22 ounce bottles are our primary package. Um, and we can talk about other things. A lot of this is transferable to 12 ounce package or even labels for cans or promotional labels. But the vast majority of what we do is runs like you see on the screen from two colors to five colors. You know, anywhere from a couple thousand to 50,000 piece runs at a time is kind of our sweet spot. So, next slide, please. Wait, I just want to ask you, do you have any cideries yet, or are you? We do have a little bit of cider business. Um, I'm trying to think. We have a great sales rep that really brought this business to us. His name is Sean, and if anybody's local and has been around Rose City Labels, Sean's a great guy. Um, I'm not, it's not company. We've uh, we've done some work for High Wheel Wines, which is a meadery that's just opening up. They had a soft open last week, and now they're opening uh, for the public this coming weekend. A great guy named Ken Bonin. Um, but cideries are not coming to mind. We we do, of course, we got a, you know certainly a, probably an equal number of wineries that we've been printing for for years and years and years. But beer has been the, the big growth area for us. So people are asking about your region. Is Oregon based breweries or how large? Uh, are great you? question. Yes, um, mostly Oregon breweries. Yes, um, we've got a brewery in California. We've got a brewery in uh, Wisconsin. We've got a brewery in Alaska. We've got a couple in Washington State. So, you know, like I said, 50 breweries. You know, 35 of them are within 30 miles of here. But you know, we certainly do have a little bit further geographic reach, and uh, it, you know, it all depends. It's all about the freight. I mean, there are a lot of great label companies around the country. Um, because we've solved this problem for a lot of people, it, it makes it a little bit easier for us. But you know, labels are rather heavy for the for the dollar value of the commodity. It's a lot of freight, so if, you know, it, it'll be hard for us to compete with somebody in. Connecticut or Kansas City or Florida, but today that's kind of our footprint, Pacific Northwest with a few outliers in different areas. But when you give your pricing, mm -hmm. you feel like your pricing is pretty representative of oh, yeah. the rest of the U.S. Absolutely. Okay, so yes. when we have the cost questions, yes, it'll be applicable generally to your local label printer. Is your focus on this? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, certainly we'll we'll sell to anybody. We, we're happy. Your, your money is green all across the United States, and uh, yeah, no, we're we're in the custom printing business though, and I've got to say that the um, it's not easy. We we've never we've got a, a pretty active website. We get a lot of traffic there, but when it really comes down to put together an order, there's a lot, a lot of variables, and so we generally like to be able to at least talk to somebody on the phone, if not meet them face to face. Um, but we're certainly all about growing the business in, in whatever way makes sense for everybody involved. Uh, so, so we welcome any inquiries from anybody. So, uh, again, good representative sample. So, I like to start this talk with the, you know begin with the end in mind, which is how are we going to get these labels onto the bottle? Um, I know that there's all various uh, levels of people, and maybe not in this class, but in the classes I've spoken to before. From home brewers just getting out in their first commercial batch to you know large scale breweries. So if you're hand applying labels like this in the slide, uh, you know you got different challenges than you might have if you're using a mobile bottler or if you're using uh, your own bottling line equipment. So think about that when you're talking to your brew to your whoever your label company is. I try to say this. I mean, I certainly want to promote Rose City Label, but this should be a white paper type presentation. The stuff I tell you should be applicable to your local 
label company as well. So let's go to the next slide. Um, the next step up in application is some kind of a tabletop. Uh, these machines, we don't sell them, but I can direct you to someone that does. Uh, they cost anywhere from $1,000 to $3,500, and they're a nice entry-level solution. Uh, depending on your batch size, might work very, very well for you. You got complete flexibility. You can bottle and label as needed on demand, and uh, you know that's a nice entry-level system. So the labels are coming on a roll. On Correct. The, um, attached to this tape. Correct. Yes. Those so who haven't seen it. Yeah. Sorry about that. The uh, everything we do, or for the most part, I should say, uh, everything starts in a roll and ends in a roll. So that allows automatic application with a you know with some kind of a potentially an automated bottling line, fill, cap, and label in one pass, or like in this case, all you're doing is labeling. And Melanie's right, um, this can either be a machine-driven or a motor-driven with some kind of a foot pedal. You lay the bottle into that cradle, step on the, the, the foot pedal, and it advances and puts the label on. Or it can even be a hand crank. The least expensive machines are around $750. You can actually just crank it by hand as you lay the bottle into the cradle. Wouldn't recommend that for more than you know, 25 or 50 cases. Uh, sticky labels or glue labels? Great question, Chef. Um, all of our labels are what's called pressure sensitive, which just means they're peel and stick. You don't need water to activate the glue. Uh, we'll talk about this more later, but um, our, our market is for craft segment here in Oregon. Probably 2,000 to 50,000 is the sweet spot. If you are Ordering 50,000 or more on a you know monthly basis, let's say, you are going to uh, probably be better served by going to a glue applied label, um, which is a just a plain paper, what we call cut and stack, because they're just individual pieces of paper that are coming in a stack as opposed to a roll, and that's what you know Coors or all the big boys just have a plain paper label, and even here in Oregon, um, some of our customers have graduated to that level. Uh, the Nikasis of the world, certainly Widmer and Bridgeport are, are into that. The Schutz is into that kind of volume category. Um, the last ones that really made that move was 10 Barrel over in Bend. And, um, you know, where our labels will vary, you know, depending on if you go very, very small volume, it might be 50 cents a label. Most of our customers are in the 18 to 8 cent a label range. And when you get to a plain paper label where you're applying your own glue, uh, you could be a penny a label or less. So it's a dramatic difference. Break side into guard, you use a generic label and just get a rubber stamp. Pros and cons uh, for a startup brewery. Um, love both of those breweries. We've done some work for Breakside and we're doing some work for the guard right now. That's all about, we'll, we'll talk about this later in the presentation, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's all about your unique brand. You as a brewer and you as an owner of a business have got to come up with, with your brand. And then from that, from that authentic brand comes your website, your logo, your on-premise design, and your labels. And some of those are very slick and very clean and very distinctive. Some are very old school, handmade, uh, farmer's market, craft, small batch. So there's no right or wrong for me as a label producer. It's really about what you want to present in the marketplace. And so that's something that's a, really a bigger question than the label, in my opinion. It makes the brand look um, pretty small scale. When it, it does. Rubber stamping it. Right. But that's your call. If you want to be small batch and you're really handcraft and, you, and that's your deal, um, you, you can make a business out of that. If you want to go mainstream, you want distribution, and you want to be in retail chains, it's a whole different game. You're probably not going to be able to do the uh, the, the hand stamp or the hand numbering. Mm -hmm. Cost difference, normal labels to die cut and custom shape labels. Another great question. Um, let me come back to that one because we're gonna we're gonna run out of time because this is so much fun. Let's go next. So once you graduate from the desktop hand labeler, you get to a more of a, a semi or full automatic labeling line. Um, and here in Oregon, we have a couple of great uh, service providers to the industry. One is Owen from Craft Canning, who's probably going to present or has been a resource for this uh, 
this no, program in the past. Movies. They see movies. You see the movie about Owen from Craft Canning. Mm -hmm. Another guy here in Portland called Green Bottling, a guy named Mike Wexler that we've worked with extensively. And they basically have this kind of a bottling line in a Sprinter van, and they'll come back up to your brewery, roll out their labeling line, and hook up the hose. They'll fill, cap, label, and put these in cases. And they can do 700,000 cases a day. So this bottling line could be anywhere from $7,500 and $25,000, depending on if it's new or used, and some of the bells and whistles. So um, this is when you're getting into big time and you're a real production brewery and you're really making a business out of this. Whether you own that equipment or not, um, you know, the, the idea of renting a fraction of that equipment, and you get a heck of a lot better people and a lot better equipment. Uh, probably not wise to buy this equipment if you're only bottling, you know, one day every other week. So that's a great business strategy. And again, there's at least two people that I know of here in Portland that have made a hell of a business. Uh, now, the downside of that is per day. So if you forget to buy your labels like a lot of brewers do, uh, it's a mad dash. I mean, we just had a great, good customer over in Central Oregon today. Wants to bottle six o'clock Monday morning, and uh, today is Tuesday, and he's got new artwork, and he wants twenty thousand labels in essentially three working days, uh, which is not our favorite production schedule. So yeah, uh, luckily we're blessed and we're busy, and we got a lot of other people in mind, but we always figure out how to make it happen. So, but that's so. Begin with the end in mind. How are you going to get these labels onto the bottle? Whatever your local situation is, whatever your bottling and application method is, make sure you share that with the label company because it makes a big difference. Let's go to the next slide. So here's a whole variety of 22s. Um, these all happen to be rectangles. Probably two-thirds of the, of the labels we do are this standard size, which is four inch by five inch round corner rectangle. Uh, to the question on the table there about the cost, for us and I believe other companies, um, everything we do is die cut. I mean, that's a part of the label printing process. Print it, laminate it, or varnish coat it, die cut it, and deliver it in a roll. This die just happens to be a rectangle. So whether it's a rectangle or a circle or it's got a bump out on the top, um, you really the only difference in cost from us is the cost of the die itself, which could be anywhere from $300 to $600. And you buy that once, and that's good for a million labels. So. If you buy a million labels, we'll buy a new die. So uh, that's really the only difference is the one-time cost, non-recurring cost of a uh, of a cutting die for a special shape. Let's go to the next slide. All right, and Melly updated these. This is our friends here at Groundbreaker, which used to be called Harvester Brewing. Um, they're one of the leading gluten-free breweries in the country and perhaps the world. Uh, highly awarded and really awesome people, small shop, nice people, and we've done all their labels pretty much since their inception. Um, great example of a, essentially a two-color label. Um, there's one background color, uh, maybe three colors. I think there's probably a darker color and a lighter color of the same uh, green, tan, or blue, and then there's probably black for the UPC. So very distinctive brand. Uh, you can tell what it is, the line all goes together, uh, but there's also a distinction among the different items within their line. So, very cost-effective label, not super expensive in the, in the realm of things. Um, things that drive price are label complexity, label size, and most importantly, quantity. Um, volume cures a lot of problems in business. So if you're buying a lot, if you're, you know, your your unit price is going to go down considerably. So now you, when you talk about complexity, what are some of the complexity variables? You've got color and the mm -hmm. number of colors. Yes. And what else? Um, well, we'll see some of those when we go to the next labels. Um, okay. Number of colors, physical size of the label, uh, any embellishments. If you have foil stamping, if you have embossing, if you have a really tricked out die cut, if we still have the. Uh, Crux label in here, mm -hmm. um, you know that's another one that you know I, when I said earlier the cost difference with die cut, I'm I'm speaking within the realm of normalcy. Um, we have a great project featured in here that's just a funky, very complex, intricate die cut, and that kind of takes it out of the realm of the normal level. But 
Um, there's kind of a nice palette of, uh, again, that one on the bottom left as I'm looking at the screen, Klamath Basin Brewing. That's probably five colors. It's got a full color image of hops in the background, and then it's got a, a separate solid color on the sides. Um, that's on the on the more complex side. Um, all the other labels there are, you know, two to three colors. Pretty simple designs, uh, but again, it all comes back to your brand. That 10 barrel label is very simple, two colors, couldn't be more cost effective, and they've got a killer brand. Everybody recognizes that, that barrel logo with the 10 on it. I mean, that is what you want, is a recognizable brand mark that translates across all of your merch, all your beers, your in-store merchandise, and your website. So the label doesn't have to be complicated to be distinctive. So. so Chef Dan is asking two or three colors much cheaper than five color? Mm. Great question, Chef. Um, again, so um, this is the perfect time to insert this conversation. Uh, there is two radically different types of printing that we do, and most major label companies do this as well. There's digital printing, which is plateless printing, on demand. There's no true setup fees. There may be die cutting and whatnot. But, uh, and then there's conventional printing, where there are printing plates and uh, there's some other hard costs in terms of setup. Right now, the digital presses go about 20% of the speed. I mean, literally one-fifth the speed. So as you can imagine, I mean, you guys are, you know, are in business class. There's a place where the lines cross on the spreadsheet where, yes, there's no setup fee, there's no prep, there's virtually no waste, but the machine only goes so fast. So at some point, it makes sense to spend some money up front, typically $75 to $100 per color. So to answer your question, Dan, a little more directly, that's your one-time or non-recurring cost, getting $75 to $100 per color. So the difference between three and five is, you know, maybe two colors, $75 to $100 in setup. Now, the ongoing cost of printing may be 15 to 20% more. So, uh, you know, a seven cent label might go to eight and a half cents, given the same volume and size and everything else. Um, and that's because there's setup involved. It takes time to set up that job. Uh, the other side of that is the digital, which is growing. I mean, that's the fastest growing part of our business. It's still only about 10 to 12% of the business every month, but two years ago it was nothing. So that's where there are no plates, there are no setup fees, and everything's full color. So one color, eight colors, you're all paying the same price. Um, there are some limitations. You can't render all colors exactly on a digital machine. Um, and again, at this point, they're considerably slower. So for us right now with our equipment lineup, that, that line crosses over at about of one label, one design, um, 1,500 to 2,500 labels. So virtually all of our brewery customers are on the longer run traditional press. They pay some money for setup, but then you know that's where you're in the you know seven to 15, 18 cent range for a price of a label. Um, if you're digital, literally doesn't matter one color, four color, five color. Um, and I do believe that over the next you know the next five years for sure in Ferocity label, we're, we're contemplating a fairly major equipment acquisition, uh, which will get that that speed differential up to about instead of five to one, maybe like two to one. So now the changeover might be 10,000 labels as opposed to 2,000 labels where it makes sense to go on a, a larger printing press. Uh, the other thing, uh, and, and this is all talking about one item, um, where nothing competes with digital is if you have versions. If you have 50 different labels, for whatever reason, probably not in a brewery scenario, you have 50 different labels and you want 100 of each, it's got to be digital. You know, if you want to have, if you want to change your artwork every quarter to make a new seasonal and you're never going to print that label again, it's pretty much got to be digital because every every quarter, every month, every week, you're going to be throwing away that three to $500 investment in printing plates. So there are some scenarios where it, it makes sense to go digital regardless of the volume. But in a standard label like you see on the screen, today in my business, two to three thousand you go to press. In, in you know, in a matter of three months, that may be ten thousand where you change over and down the line, and that that, that crossover point's only gonna get higher and higher. 
because eventually all printing will be digital printing. It's, it's not a matter of if, it's just when. So what is the digital at the lower volumes, what does it cost relative to this kind of you know, if you're, label? Yeah, if you're doing a very low low run, I mean, if you're doing a seasonal and you get 500 labels, um, you know, you're going to be in the 70 cent range. Yeah, so substantially. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and part of that is just the kind of the, the cost to turn on the machine. I mean, we kind of are, are, we don't want to really even come to work in the morning for less than about $350. So 500 labels of 70 cents, you know, because by the time we take your artwork, we send you a proof, we get it signed off, we print it, we ship it, we send you a bill, we wait 30 days, we drive to the bank. There's, there, you know, you got to have some kind of a floor, and that's yeah. where we are. And then, honestly, if you're below 500 labels, you should just make them on your home computer. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, that's okay, it's just not... It doesn't make economic sense to go to a label company. So, next slide, please. So here's an example, a perfect example of a nice die cut label. A wonderful man here. Um, he paid for that die about seven years ago, and he's been using it ever since. And he likes that rounded top that shows off his logo a little more. And he's also a very good example of a simple, you know, it's maybe four colors, but it's spot colors. So it's got a cream an orange, kind of a, that, that copper color, and then the main body color brown. So he virtually changes, I mean, he probably has 20 different labels uh, because he makes a lot of very specialized uh, barrel-aged bourbon, and he's, he has a, a warehouse sale once a year, and he sells everything out. I mean, it's like ridiculous. He's got a cult following, and he's a really smart guy. Um, but that's an example of a die cut label. It doesn't cost any more. The fact that that label it's got a hump on the top, doesn't cost any more. So all the labels that he has have that hump on the top. That is true. Now that's another thing um, that what you do want to do is decide on a label design, size, and shape and stick with it. Because this guy, you know, two times a year he orders 25,000 labels and that's typically five batches of 5,000 each. So he makes certain batches and you can see in the in that center, uh, right above 12 fluid ounces, says, in this one it says 2013, because um, this is kind of a specialty item. But his main core beers, he has a batch number in there, and I think he's up to batch. You know, So he'll call and say, hey, I need uh, Fred. Like Fred is one of his core beers. This particular label is Bourbon Fred from the wood, which means it's barrel aged in a, in a cool barrel. Uh, his standard Fred, he's probably up to batch 85. He makes you know three or four batches a year. So he'll call up and say, hey, I need Fred batch 84, 85, 86, and 87. 5,000 of each. And then uh, you know, one of his other popular beers is Adam. And uh, they're all named after dogs, by the way, uh, which is really cool. That's what I'm talking about with your brand. I mean, there's no doubt what this guy's all about. You, you see it in every single label. It translates into his, his pub. Um, it's really neat. Every label is different, but every label is the same in this line. So let's go next. So this is one we love showing. Um, this is a five-color label, and that is what Melly was talking about, the graphic complexity. It's Even on the screen, you can see a lot of the detail in person. I mean, when you look at that ship and the wave and the splash, I mean, it, you get water on your face just looking at the label. It's so realistic. So that's complex and it's difficult and honestly we couldn't do that five to seven years ago. Just the technology and printing has gotten so much better. So that's going to be a more expensive label. That also happens to be, um, he has that in a 750 ml wine bottle. It's a real low, large label. You can't tell from the screen, but it's probably like three and a half by ten. So it's a big label. It almost wraps all the way around the base of, the, of a wine bottle. Um, he puts a cork and a, and a cage, more like a champagne bottle, and a, and a foil, and he sells these for, you know, 20, 22 bucks a bottle. So, again, a little different business model, very specialized, very uh, small batch production. Mm -hmm. He probably orders 3,000 labels, uh, you know, maybe maybe three, three big batches of 3,000, three times a year. So, small batch, very successful. Pretty well distributed too. Yeah. Uh, here's another five color label, a full full color uh, image in the center, and then black on the sides. And then it's hard to see, but that the word block 15, the words Pappy's dark, and the border all the way around the label is a foil stamp. 
So we print this five colors on a printing press, then we take it over to the nether machine and physically stamp with a with a magnesium plate at about 220 degrees, stamp uh, that foil on there. So again, small batch, very uh, particular, very detail oriented, and uh, you know, a great customer for us. But again, it's a slightly different business model. So let's go next. Uh, this is an example of a clear label with white, that light blue, and black, and it's on clear and it goes on a can. Um, these guys, uh, Base Camp has been a super success story here in Portland. They're core beers, they use an uh, anodized aluminum can. They actually have a 22 ounce can with a bottle cap on top. Uh, it basically looks like a, a bottle shaped can. Um, so they're core beers, they're bought, you know, if, typically for pre-printed cans, you have to buy 250,000 at a time to get a decent price. So they've got an IPA, they've got a Pilsner, they've got a Stout, they've got a Porter. Uh, that's, uh, you know, a million and a half cans for their core beers. And it, those things are, they're not that expensive and they don't weigh hardly anything, but they take up a lot of volume. So you got to have some warehouse space to store all of that. Uh, luckily, these guys do. They're extremely well capitalized, nice people, great family. Um, but for their small batches, what they want to do is seasonal or some funky, and they're going to do 5,000 of them or 10,000 of them. They're going to buy a more of a generic kind of a plain can and then get a label. So this is an example of that. Um, that is not a die cut label. That whole label is one piece of clear label stock. But because of the way we put white behind kind of the images you want to read, um, it, it looks like it's die cut or it looks like it's you know kind of floating on the can. So it kind of gives the same effect of printing directly on the can. Yeah, I was wondering, Christian's asking this, how is that applied? No, that's a pressure sensitive. Um, the clear stuff is, is a yeah, sticker. Same, clear sticker. same material, same press, same everything. Peel and stick label, just like. Uh, um, Just like the label, like these labels right there. They're come and roll, peel back, stick it on. Um, sorry, in this one, do the scrap slash defect rates increase in line with complexity? The answer to that, Trevor, is yes, and that's what drives up the cost. Um, scrap rates, setup time, etc., for me increases. Um, if we're doing our job right, it shouldn't affect you on your end. Uh, meaning, you know, it should go on on the line, the bottling line, uh, exactly the same, whether it's two colors or five colors. Um, so that shouldn't change on your end, but you're going to be paying me for more defect and scrap. Um, we used to say, and we're a lot better than this now, but 20 years ago when I started, we said half hour per color for setup. So five color label will take two and a half hours to get set up, register, color correct. So that's a lot of time, which equals a lot of money. And you got to amortize that. You amortize that over 100,000 labels, not much, not much of a problem. If you're only 5,000 labels, you know, two and a half hours of setup is enormous. So we, we don't like that. But uh, next question. Most labels are shiny, coated for waterproof. Is it possible to get matte, rough, paper-like label that is waterproof? Uh, Yes and no and maybe. Uh, great question. So you're correct. Um, these labels are actually a matte finish, but they're still a poly label stock. This is not a paper. Um, if I peel this off, uh, it's actually called a synthetic paper, which is kind of a you know a version of a poly. I can't tear it with my fingers. You can't see my plan with the bottle with the label here, but. Uh, um, you're right. These got to hold up. They've got to go into a corrugated box. They got to get shipped on a truck. Then they got to go into a cold case in the retail. You buy it. You take it home. You put it in an ice bucket. These labels we're asking them to do a lot. So for us, probably two thirds or three fourths of the labels we do are on this this exact material. Um, as I mentioned, you got to know what you're doing with your with your mobile bottler, and we have partnerships with these guys locally. Uh, they love the material, sticks on the bottle like it's painted on, and it works very well. It doesn't bubble, pucker, or uh, shrink in the in the cold case. But with the same material, we can put a high gloss laminate on it to make it shiny, or we can do a matte or a dull laminate. 
Um, and that's, you know, that's the vast majority of what we do. But it's not rough. It's not rough. It's a so smooth finish. It's a smooth finish, yes. Yeah. So there's two questions there. One is the sheen or the visual look. The second is the tactile. Um, so second question is rough paper-like. Um, so you'll see this in a lot of wine labels. Um, you know, and if you have a white wine, a Chardonnay, a Pinot Gris, that's going to go in a cold case as well. Might go into an ice bucket. Um, so it's definitely possible. The other thing, though, is that from a graphical standpoint, um, for us and for most label printers, um, it's tough to print on a rough surface. So if you print on a rough surface, you've got to be considering the graphics that you're using. Um, if it's a simple kind of line art logo, or if you don't mind more of a model or speckled look, um, like this solid black would never, I mean, it would look okay, but it's, you can't see it's almost full coverage of black. Um, it would not be a solid black because most label presses are like ours. We use a, a liquid ink and that liquid will absorb. I mean, it's like printing on a sponge and you've got peaks and valleys in the microscopic surface of that, uh, which gives you that nice tactile rough feel, but it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't be play nicely with a printing press. So it's all, again, it's in the eye of the beholder. If you want a more of a craft, old world uh, look, then certainly there's a lot of different materials available. Um, it's just not a smooth surface to print on. And so it's, you know, it's something to know going in. Um, we got a great example in my office of the label we did for Full Sail about five years ago. And it was a barrel age series. It was very kind of artsy and they wanted an uncoated they came in for a press check and it was awful. Uh, it was it was like, it was so muted, all the colors just died because they just soaked into the paper. And we ended up running it on a, on a coated stock, which isn't what they thought they wanted. And they didn't listen because, you know, it's hard. You, you haven't seen it in person. And so once they saw, you know, well, let's show you what this looks like on coated. And like most people, we could change that over and show them another sample on a coated stock. And it just, it was night and day, so. Something to be aware of and when you're designing your art. If you want to go uncoated, you need to need to let everybody know that up front and, and design your artwork accordingly. Yeah, and Jennifer actually has a label there. We uh -huh. have a brewery and the current label it would probably be a little too complicated to do on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unless you I'm did sorry, special Jennifer. editions with simplifying simplifying that a lot, I yeah. think it wouldn't translate to a paper like label very well with the kind of material you want. Right. Um, but, you know, I'd love to talk to you offline. I'm not familiar with the label, but, uh, you know, that's probably why it sounds like, you know, you're obviously working with a different label company than ours, and they probably steered you in the same direction for the same reasons that I'm saying. Um, not that's the only solution, but that's, you know, typically a good solution. I think Adam's printing them on the computer, right, Jennifer? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> one way. to tell me. Excellent. Um, all right, Ryan, how much on average a screen printed label of bottles cost? And does that amount of layers of colors dictate the cost, minimum order amount? Uh, great question, Ryan. I don't do that personally, um, but I can tell you that, uh, so on average, I, I can't even tell you. Um, I don't know if it's 25 cents. I, don't, I, I really don't even know. Um, but yes, I know for sure the amount of colors and layers do dictate and the minimum depends on who you're working with. There's a great company here in Bend, Oregon called Cascade Graphics. We're unmuted again. Um, Cascade Graphics over in Bend, they're dear friends of mine. And they've gotten into growlers and also just 22s and maybe some 12s. I know they do the, the bottle from Good Life Brewing over in Bend. And uh, they put in a whole line with it because it's very specialized equipment to, first of all, they've got a uh, basically put the bottle through a furnace to activate the surface tension and clean the glass and make it receptive to ink. And then they've got to have a, a particular type of screen, screen printing machine that can take a bottle in a, in a cradle, sort of like one of those hand uh, labelers that we showed in an earlier slide, and then it rotates and, and it transfers around as the, as the printing is happening. So yes, more complex, costs more. And the, the complexity of the graphics is not nearly as, as, as fine as you can get in a label. I mean, obviously, I'm a label guy, so I'm going to say that, but just 
you, you're going to have more block graphics and two color designs. You're not going to be able to probably screen print a photograph onto a glass bottle. Uh, but they got a lot of advantages. There's a lot of eco advantages. Uh, so that's uh, okay. Christian, sorry. Uh, base camp style labels can apply to a generic can. Yeah, they could. Buy only aluminum colored cans and vary labels. Yes, Christian, that's a great way to do it. Um, they can be applied uh, to a generic can, and that's kind of what Basecamp is doing. Yeah, they have so, a generic bottle can. A bottle style can, but yeah, any can will work, absolutely. Um, Ryan says, damn, okay, and thanks. Well, hopefully, Ryan, you got the contact information. Yeah, Cascade remember, Graphics. Cascade Graphics would be a good place to call about that bottle. Yeah, uh, Billy Sharon is the one of the owners of the company, a great guy, and he's in Portland frequently. I don't know, Ryan, if you're in Portland, but uh, He's a good guy and he'll take good care of you. Uh, Salium uh, says, is that the SKU barcode? Yes. So on the base camp label, the, the UPC code or a barcode, um, yeah, Seattle, you might, uh, there's probably somebody up there, uh, but it's worth, Brian, talking to these guys. I think it's cascadegraphics.com, but if you just Google screen printing Bend, Oregon, you'll find them. They've been around forever and they're quite good. Um, yes, that is the barcode. And with the UPC code, um, what, the, what the reader is reading is the bars and spaces. So the size, the width of the bar, and the space between the bars is extremely important. But the vertical height of the label, or the barcode rather, is not important. And scalloping that or changing it into a mountain, I've got somebody right now that I'm doing this for, and they want to make their code into the state, shape of the state of Oregon, which is basically a rectangle, but it's got kind of a cool little swing to it that makes it look like Oregon. So yes, that is the UPC that scans at the register, and that's no problem. Um, next up, okay, so this is the, the beautiful crazy label I was talking about, the Crux Fermentation Project, also over in Bend. Total all-star team of designers, brewers, um, just brilliant people. What they've got there is on the left-hand side as you're looking at it, it's just a, the Crux, the cross, uh, and, and that's it. I mean, that's the label. So that was a pretty tricky die, die cut. Um, getting the getting the space in between all those to pull out just physically on the press, and then on the other, on the double cross line on the right hand side, it's the reverse of that, um, where the where and they had to they had to manually peel that out because we didn't have any mechanical way to pull that piece out. Um, but boy, they got that brand in their head and they love it and they're kind of a collaborative of, of all-star brewers and designers and they weren't going to mess around. I mean, we suggested clear labels where you just make a rectangular label and print that design and get 99% of the effect and they weren't hearing it. That wasn't authentic. They wanted a cross and that was what they were going to have. So it's been a little bit of a challenge, uh, but a beautiful complex line of labels. And uh, probably, again, it might retract my earlier comment that it doesn't cost any more for die cut. If you do crazy die cut, it does cost more. Yeah, well, plus applying that. Cross yeah, oh, yeah, it's, it's a nightmare it's all the way around. It's not easy for anyone. No, no, but they figured it out, and it's worth it to them. So let's go next. Uh, so this is something that we've uh, branched into a little bit recently. Uh, most everything we do is pressure sensitive, meaning peel and stick. Um, but a lot of our brewer clients don't have a good source for keg colors. These are just either uh, poly, like a plastic, or a paper or a tag stock. Um, we bought the die. It's got some little slits in the center, so it'll slip over the neck of the keg. And then we can print you know, whatever you want on there, uh, including the TTB information as far as alcohol. And uh, a lot of these, you can't see it on this one, but they'll have uh, different around the perimeter of the circle. Um, months and also days of, you know, brewed on date essentially. And, uh, and so those are uh, another product that we're offering to, uh, to the brewery customers. So, all right, here you go. Tech info. Oh, he uh, minimum run for keg colors. Great question, Jennifer. Um, we're trying, we're doing a couple of different things. Uh, plastic and paper, Ryan, um, probably 25% increase. I've got it on the website, but I don't know right off the top of my head just because it's a fairly new product. We've done it for you know a handful of brewers. Um, Jennifer, to your question, uh, we're doing generic collars. 
So if you don't need them branded with Dragon State Brewery, and you can buy a hundred of them. I know a lot of startup breweries, they just, you know, write on it with a Sharpie and the way they go. So we wanted to have something that's truly, you know, on the shelf. Tell me what you want, we'll put it in a box or in an envelope and send them down to you. But uh, but we can go, we can certainly go up from there to more customization. So you are welcome. Um, so not only is the label a branding vehicle, but it's also a, an important piece of consumer information. So these next couple of slides talk about all that technical info. And I'm not a lawyer, my wife's a lawyer, she's not a brewery lawyer, but uh, uh, this is definitely something that you've got to look at. Um, we got everything from people that just kind of do their best and hope for the best to people that have their lawyer review every label and, and your mileage may vary. That's up to you and the way you want to run your business. But it is serious stuff and it, it can be a problem. We'll show you an example of kind of a funny one. But uh, these are kind of some guidelines. Um, I got these from a seminar that I went to. It was actually a CLE or a continuing legal education seminar for lawyers about the brewing and distilling and wine industry. It's held every year here in Oregon and I highly recommend it. Um, I think they should market it more to breweries. Um, it was a room full of lawyers and a few industry people like me, and I learned a ton. Um, but it would really be something that would help an industry person, meaning a producer like yourselves, to get educated, spend a couple hundred bucks, and it'll save you a lot of money and paying hassle, legal fees, graphic designer fees. Um, so if you can get a hold of something like that, um, it, it would be worthwhile. If you're in the Portland area, like I said, they do it every year, so it's, it's worth going to. So here's some of the points. Again, I'm not aware, I don't even play one on TV, but uh, the federal government is what the agency that, that covers everything, uh, and they issue what's called a COLA or Certificate of Label Approval. Um, they're handled by the Tax and Trade Bureau or the TTB, so this is often called TTB approval. Um, this is required uh, before you put the product in the bottle and label it. Um, you can get an exemption, it depends on your state, your county, and a lot of other things, and that's probably the overriding thing is you're, it's all local. It's all national, but it's really all local, so you've got to figure that out, and I'm sorry I don't. These are guidelines. Do I know if it applies to Puerto Rico, Christian? I don't know, and so yeah, your, your local mileage may vary. Um, if you're only local, within intrastate, meaning within your own state, then you may be exempt from the from the federal regulations. Um, state differs from federal uh, deposits, for example. We have a, a, a deposit here in Oregon. Not every state has it. Uh, typical time is 60 days, so please don't wait. Um, typically what happens with wine and beer uh, is that we will get our work from a customer. We'll tweak it a little bit. We'll go back and forth with them. They say, yep, that's exactly what I want. And then we have to give them a very specific resolution of a JPEG file, which is a computer file format, I'm sure you're familiar with, like a photograph. But it's not the format that we typically work in. It's not what we use to print labels. So we'll create a JPEG for them, and they have to upload that to the government website and then wait. And again, it depends on if it's a brand new label, if it's a changed label, if it's just in the case of a wine, it's new vintage, new varietal. It may not take as long, but if it's an entirely new label, especially if it's got anything controversial, it can take a while. Um, the whole idea here is pur purpose is to prohibit consumer deception. So no misleading claims, nothing that you can't back up, certainly nothing that's not true, uh, nothing that's attributed that makes your, that would cause confusion in the eyes of the consumer. It can't be called cough syrup beer or anything like that that would, that would be misleading. Even as funny or tongue-in-cheek as it might be, uh, sometimes they, they really take this to an absurd level. Uh, readable and ordinary, readable under ordinary lighting conditions, contrasting background, and in English. Those are kind of general broad guidelines. Next slide. Um, these are the must-haves, and I tell people two things. Number one, that ttp.gov is a great resource. A lot of this is very well spelled out. You can download white papers. Um, the other thing, though, whether it's a food product, a beer, a wine, a cider, go look at what the big boys are doing. I mean, copy the Widners and the Deschutes and the Ten Barrels of the World, because they've got this done. 
Full sales got lawyers, they figure this stuff out. And just look at what they do. Look at the font, the font size, look at the size of their health warning statement, um, all of that stuff. You know, if you copy them, you'll be pretty, pretty well fine. What do they have on the front panel and the center? What do they have on the side of the label? Um, those are good guidelines. Look at your competition. I think that I already gave them the whole all the files and guidelines with font size. And Tons. Font. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say you're very slippery slope slippery slope. Um, Nobody knows what to do with cider and mead and all of these barley wines and different classifications. Uh, they don't know where to shelve them in the grocery store and they don't know how to regulate them. Um, it's just interesting how the particular facilities are licensed and how their labeling requirements are. I mean, it's, it's, it's new territory. It's a wild west. And as you might know, the federal government is really good at being flexible. And so it's, it's still to be determined. So check that out as you go. Alcohol content. Um. Um, great question. Kind of don't have ABV. Um, you know, that could be a state, state dependent uh, requirement. Uh, I remember for years I lived in Colorado and they had 3-2 beer. And this is 25 years ago where they had bars you could drink this low alcohol, low octane beer when you were 18. But to drink real you know, hard liquor, you had to be 21. I think Colorado may have changed or done away with that. I don't know what, but yeah, um, I, didn't have that I didn't think they but did. Utah has it. Utah yeah. has it. But you don't have to put. We didn't have to put 3.2 on the label uh -huh. because everybody knew if you go out in the liquor store yeah. that it, it was going to be it's low alcohol. Beer. Now yeah. they have some high alcohol beers allowed, so I think they changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, hard dog. <laughs> uh, we do some graphic design. Yes. Um, we have great people that are really good production artists, meaning they can take your label and resize it and get all the elements together, but we're not a true branding agency. If you need a logo and a brand and a website and, and a whole marketing package, we're probably not the best choice, but we could refer you to independent graphic designers that do great work for you. Uh, but if you've got all those elements or you've got Porter and you need Lager and Pilsner and Stout, um, you know, we can extend your line and, and we can certainly do the mechanics of changing it from, you know, 22 ounce to 12 ounce to whatever. So, great question. Thank you. Uh, let's go next. Uh, this is the, the no-nos slide. Uh, nothing false or misleading. Uh, lawsuit brought against Tito's, made by hand. Uh, yeah, Josh, you're going to get a kick out of this next one because, uh, I love Tito's Hogan, by the way. Um, you know, it's, it is just the first bullet. False or misleading? What does that mean? You know, who says it's false or misleading? How many people does that mislead? Uh, I don't know. Uh, statements of representation of analysis, purity, uh, guarantees. Certainly, if you say, you know, this will grow your hair back, uh, this will make you 10 years younger, you can't say that. You can't disparage a competitor. Um, name, image, or public uh, confusion. I mean, you can't make a, I don't know, Michael Jordan or any, you know, any kind of a public figure that that might imply that that person has endorsed it. Even if you like that person and it's flattering, it's not okay. Um, geographic references are a little sketchy, especially with wine. Um, they have very protective uh, territories about their AVAs or their uh, American Bitter Cultural. Association regions, uh, you got to be, you know, you, you, it, the grapes have to come from where you say. Uh, no government stamp seal or flag, you can't use a coin or a government seal or a picture of the White House. Um, and no armed forces, emblems, seal, rank, or flag. However, I, I will tell you, I did, a, uh, I did a distilled spirits project about a year ago, and these people were all about giving back to the veterans and World War II. And, and their bottle had all those elements. It looked like a World War II canteen. It was a specialized bottle and it had a dog tags hung around the neck of it at the liquor store. I don't know how they did that. I don't know, you know, they claim that they got their approvals and they signed off and we made a lot of labels for them, so. But you can't put a U.S. flag on it. No, no U.S. flag. So then, uh, you know, to the, to the point about, uh, uh, Chef, there's no requirement for ABV. Uh, no picture of U.S. flag, I would say no. Um, yeah, I didn't think there was an ABV generally 
people are adding it now on a voluntary basis because the beers are getting so strong. Well, that's true too. I mean, and that's I mean, you got to look at what's the what's the law and what's the common practice and what do the consumers want. I mean, uh, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, so my the next slide, the no holy water. You love this. This is a personal example of a real customer here in Southern Oregon. Uh, so yeah, I got to give you the disclaimer. Use common sense. Follow the market. Uh, not legal advice because I don't give it and I don't have it, but uh, let's keep going. So this is a great customer of ours down in Southern Oregon, uh, SOB, Southern Oregon Brewing. Again, a great example of somebody that follows their brand. Uh, all of his, this guy's a great guy, Tom Hammond is his name, and uh, for whatever, you know, his whole branding is around being an SOB and uh, everything that flows from that. Um, he made this my uh, a couple of years ago, seasonal, 5,000 labels, no big deal. And this, he's a guy that's busy and he's moving and shaking. So what he typically does is sends us the files, signs them off, we print them, and then he sends it to TTB. Or they don't respond fast enough, and so he says, oh, you know, it's just like all my other labels, no big deal. Uh, so he got this label kicked back. And I'm just giving you bullet points. There are many other details in the regulations. I was no means an exhaustive list, but just like your handmade Tito's vodka question, this label was rejected because they said it doesn't, you, it does not contain, or you can't prove it contains holy water. So go to the next slide. Uh, this is the revised slide. They said you had to put underneath contains no holy water, and you put the words holy water in quotes. So if you go back, and you go back on, uh, yeah, the word, the main name says holy water. You know, some priest in your parish might pick this up and start doing baptisms with it if they hadn't fixed the label. So there we go. We had to put quotes around it and put underneath contains no holy water. Um, you know, I think this guy used the labels that were already out, um, but in this case, you know, this is a five color label and it was conventional because uh, the, uh, you know, digital wasn't as big back in the day. And that was a $500 mistake. Uh, who's liable? Say I came to you, do you guys triple check all the legalities, my responsibility? That's a great question, Mike. Uh, that is 100% on you. Um, we do not make any, I mean, we'll give you guidance, but we print for wine, beer, spirits, food, medicine, supplements, nutrition products. There's no way that we can know uh, all the rules on all the different product categories. And so very clearly we say, you know, we're going to give you guidance. We're going to give you my 20 years of experience personally, but can't be our, our responsibility. Um, obvious things that are copyrighted, you know, I mean, if you're using a well-known brand name or trademark in a fanciful way, um, we're not going to let you do that. Uh, but no, this holy water thing was totally on the brewer, not on us. Thank goodness. Yeah, it wasn't a lot of labels, and he's a great customer. So, you know, I mean, the answer is, and, you know, we'll try to help you. We're, you know, we're not going to stick it to you if you have to reprint labels because you made an honest mistake. Uh, but we're also not going to eat it. So, uh, I think adding that language actually makes it better. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, Josh, sign up for the church. I mean, I happen to be Catholic, and I, I believe in all this stuff. I sent it to my parish priest, who's a beer drinking fool, and he thought it was great. You know, so I mean, it really is not a bad thing. Um, uh, Increasing serial number. What about increasing serial number labels? Um, Christian, yeah, I mean, variable data is coming. Um, I've got a customer, not a not a beer customer, but they've got a unique QR code on every label. And so when you go and you scan that QR with your phone, you're going to go to a unique landing page, not just for, you know, Joe's Bar and Grill, but that particular iteration, it's an electronics company. And, you know, they tell you exactly your product. It's sort of like a serial number registration. So can be done. Um, not typical in the beer industry, but uh, we can certainly do it. Um, and most, most label companies could do that. Um, 
So Melanie's got the last slide up there, which is my contact info. Um, happy to help any way I can. Um, and I've also got a lot of part of a national trade association, so I know label companies from New York to Florida to Southern California and Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico I know. Um, you know, know I, uh, I think we have another. You know what? I just I just went to a I just went to a a conference in Chicago, and I sat out and had beer with a guy from Trinidad. So uh, I got nothing in Puerto Rico that I know of, but I bet I could find somebody, honestly, because there is some industry down there. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, seriously, hit me up, shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions for free. Go to our website. A lot of other resources about UPC codes, and as usual, I talk too long. So there's, but I'm happy yes. to stick around. I will put the powerpoints up. Yes, yes, and yes. Happy to do that. It's easier. It's it's fun to actually look through them. Yeah. yeah. Great. It's fun. Very nice slides. Oh, we're happy to help, and thank you very much. Uh, thanks for spreading the word and making good beer. Thanks, guys. Yes, thank you, thank you. And we'll see you next week. We're having another live session next week, and we're happy. Woo! Uh, oh, for those of you going to U Brew, um, that's this weekend, right? We're going to Portland U Brew. So mm -hmm. um, look forward to meeting some new people. That'll be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Thanks to all of you, and like I said, don't be shy. You'll have the slides, and Google Rose City Label, you'll find us. Um, we've got you know, information about the keg collars, certainly about our regular labels. And uh, you guys drink before, during, and after, Jennifer. Yes, I mean, we're, I got to support my customers, you know? I mean, I, now, just, I had to go get in one of my special Portland State bottle openers. Yeah. And I brought these. It's a bike chain with a... Thing, so we can open the beer just for this. Yes, PSU. <laughs> we're setting a good example. Right. We, we yeah. We're we're working here. Can you tell? I mean, I probably got a parking ticket because I couldn't find the right that included the right spot. Yeah. Exactly. It should be. Yes. yes. This is. He brought the beer. I should yeah, be bringing I, him beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I'm happy to be a volunteer and uh, happy to do this. And thank you, Melly, for Thanks, letting Brian. me. Thank no, you. No, Brian, you're you're in good company. So cheers. Cheers, everyone. Have we'll a good see you night. next week. Yeah.